Before Naughty Dog was known for their Indiana Jones inspired franchise called Uncharted that was well received by critics and fans, especially Uncharted 2 where even to this day the train sequence is still a spectacle. It eventually received its own movie in 2002 that should have had Bruce Campbell as Sully but I'm not gonna go there. If you've watched Burn Notice then you know what I'm talking about. Before Naughty Dog was known for their super bleak, grim and gritty franchise called The Last of Us with its second injury having some of the most divisive story decisions in the past decade, it got a show that was well received despite the lack of infected. I can't wait to see how they tackle season 2 because of what I just said two sentences ago. Before all of that, there was a dynamic duo. Their names were Jack and Daxter, one being an elven boy, the other one being a muskrat, beating Ratchet and Clank to the punch by roughly a year. This was during the time where Naughty Dog's main focus was fun gameplay with a hint of story, not trying to shove gameplay into a super cinematic animated movie. This was during the time where Naughty Dog was in the 3D platformer genre, with his first franchise being the iconic Crash Bandicoot. Crash was competing with Mario and Sonic. Jack and Daxter, on the other hand, wanted to come for Banjo and Kazooie's neck. Well, that's how I see the whole thing anyways, but most likely I'm wrong. So at this point, you should already know what questions are about to be asked. After 22 years, does Jack and Daxter hold up? Should Naughty Dog bring back this dynamic duo from the grave? Are fans trying to revive this franchise because of nostalgia? Is there even anything worth reviving when it comes to this franchise? Well, let's find out. This is madness! Really seeing that much dark eco would destroy everything we know. Just look what it's done to you. It has given us a beauty beyond anything you could understand. Beauty? Have you two looked in the mirror lately? Referring to what I said earlier, the story was not the focus of this game. So here's what I was able to cobble together from the little bit we got. The story starts off with the Green Sage narrating about the world they live in. His family for generations have been trying to find answers to some looming questions. Who were the precursors? How did they harness Eco, the life energy of this world? What is their purpose and where did they go? The Green Sage asked the plants, but they don't remember anything. The plants asked the rocks and they don't remember anything. If the rocks don't remember anything, you know something's fucked up. The Sage said he believes the answer lies with this young boy that doesn't know his destiny. Then we cut to Jack and Daxter on their way to Misty Island, even though the Green Sage told them not to. While exploring, they stumble across two people and a bunch of creatures called Lurkers. They tell the Lurkers to continue searching for the artifacts and Eco, that if anyone from the village has either one, take care of them. Jack and Daxter sneak away, but they're still noticed by a Lurker. Continue to explore, Jack and Daxter find this pit filled with this dark, gooey stuff. This is when the lurker from earlier shows up. It tries to attack Jack and Daxter, but Jack stops it by throwing something. The thing that Jack threw explodes, taking out the lurker while also knocking him into Daxter. This sends Daxter flying into the pit with the dark, gooey stuff. When Daxter comes flying out of the dark goo, he is completely changed. Once he noticed, he starts screaming, especially when he finds out he doesn't have a dick anymore. They go back home to ask the Green Sage for help. He yells at them because he told them to never go there, but they didn't listen. This is what we find out what Daxter fell into. It's called Dark Ego. The Green Sage tells them that he can't help them, but the Sage Goal that lives far up north can. The thing is that his warp gate is not activated, so they'll have to go through this volcano. This is when we're introduced to Kira, the Green Sage's daughter. She tells Jack and Daxter that she can help them, that all they have to do is collect 20 power cells, while batting her eyes at Jack and calling him a brave adventurer. When talking to the Green Sage again, we find out why the Lurkers are on Misty Island. They're trying to break into the Precursor's dark eco silo to spread it everywhere. That will result in everyone changing into some strange creature or object. After traveling to the volcano, Jack and Daxter make it to the Blue Sage's place. The thing is that the Blue Sage is missing and the village is on fire from some creature throwing boulders. Kira spots a levitation machine that can help them move the boulders. She tells Jack and Daxter she needs more power cells to get it to work. 
While explaining all of this, Jack has his eyes glued to her gluteus maximus. You're a real one if you know where that's from. After defeating the creature, a path to the Red Sage's place opens up. When they get to the Red Sage's place, the sage is gone. This is when we are introduced to our villains, Gaul and Maya. They are the two people we saw at the beginning talking to the lurkers on Misty Island. In typical villain fashion, they tell everyone their evil plans. That is to release all the dark eco from the silo so they can control it. They are also responsible for the other missing sages. They talk for a little bit more than vanish, but Daxter realizes something. That goal was the one who was supposed to change him back. The green sage says, fuck all that. We need to stop them. Once Jack and Daxter make it to Gol and Maya's citadel, Kira shows up. She tells him that the green sage has been kidnapped as well. She tells Jack to be careful and they make their way inside. After Jack and Daxter free all the sages in the citadel, the green sage tells them that they have to stop Gol and Maya because they have a giant precursor robot. Before Jack and Daxter are able to defeat Gol and Maya, Jack uses White Ego to give him a huge power boost and deliver the final blow. This same White Ego could have reverted Daxter to his original form, but he decides not to. The final blow from Jack sends the head of the robot into the silo of Dark Ego. The silo's doors close as you hear Gol and Maya screaming as they sink further. The Green Sage says they're probably dead, but Daxter doesn't care about all of that because he's feeling like a badass. As everyone is congratulating each other, Jack and Kira go in for a kiss, but Daxter is having none of that. Then the game ends. So here's my thoughts on this riveting story filled with love, sadness, and betrayal. It's basic. I mean, literally, it's the most basic story I've ever seen. Like I said in the beginning, it's just there to move the game along. Also to keep the player somewhat engaged, and there's nothing wrong with that from time to time. One thing I will say is that as I was scrubbing through the footage of this game again, there were quite a few things I noticed that I didn't before that I found to be really funny. The first one is Kira pointing at Daxter when she's talking to her dad at the beginning. She's basically like, look at this nigga, what is he doing? The next one is when Jack is looking at Kira's ass while she's looking through the telescope. My man Jack was admiring every bit of it. Just look at him. It's so subtle that you can easily miss it. The last one is when the Green Sage is talking to Jack and Daxter in the Citadel about the robot. Daxter starts waving his hand like, damn, this nigga breath stink. Once again, it's so subtle that it can easily be missed, and I'm sure there's plenty more. These little things give a lot of life to this game, helping everyone feel unique and different, which is highly needed when Jack is a silent protagonist. So you need Daxter and his motor mouth with all the quips. You need Kira, AKA Little Miss Tech Geek to explain gadgets and stuff. You need the Green Sage as the authoritative voice that nobody listens to. You even need the super wooden and forgettable goal in mind because we need someone to smack around. I'd live to see the day when I needed to be rescued by a boy and his muskrat. <sighs> I'm gonna give Gall and my a little payback for this embarrassment. Then we'll see about cooking up some muskrat stew. Visually, this game tickles my nostalgia bones. I honestly love my super realistic graphics that a lot of games have today. A good recent example is Resident Evil 4 Remake. That game is absolutely beautiful from top to bottom, but there's something about the PS1 and 2 era of gaming. Basically everything before the Xbox 360 and PS3 feels like a warm hug when I play those games. When it was more about having a unique art style and gameplay than fidelity. Doing what they could with the amount of polygons that could be pushed at the time. The opening area Sandover Village is a good example with this laid back tropical setting and exaggerated designs of the huts. Everything is relatively simple, but has so much life due to the art style. This area is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this game's vast environments. Misty Island is another testament to the art style with its overbearing wasteland. 
The front half being a dried up land with bones and quicksand everywhere compared to the back half that has a ship and a bunch of wooden bridges. The boggy swamp is exactly how it sounds. A swamp that would give you that kind of ass in no time with this nonstop rain. Green and murky water that are filled with these oversized rat like creatures. Sprinkle in these areas filled with this tar like goo that can fuck you up quick. All of these segmented by wooden spikes that pop in and out the ground that you have to jump over. My favorite though is Golden Maya Citadel. This man made monstrosity that is also a labyrinth. It looks like they cobbled together whatever they could, but it looks really cool. There are different rooms to help you make your way up to the top. Each one is a spectacle within itself that you'll admire but hate if you suck at platformers like me. There are quite a few more areas I could go over, but I'm not. The same goes for our characters, Jack, Daxter, and the Green Sage, who I find to be the strongest visually in my opinion. Jack's design is really cool in my opinion, starting off with his hair. Basically, he has Super Saiyan hair. It starts off with this grass green base, then blends into this Super Saiyan yellow. The green base also reminds me of Broly's green aura. Jack's hair goes perfect with his predominantly blue outfit with the white shorts. Then the goggles are just the icing on top. Daxter's design is very simple with his fur being orange, but it matches his persona. His gloves and goggles are a nice accent to his simple design. The green sage is my personal favorite because all the little details in his design. His shoes are fire because they're basically just short stubby logs. It helps to compensate for his height but at the same time he can levitate so it's kind of stupid. Then there's just a giant log on his head as well with this bird constantly landing on it. It makes sense because he's the green sage, he's one with the earth. The last thing is that his eyes are actually small but his glasses make them look weird. It's brilliant, honestly, no joke. Now when it comes to gameplay, there isn't much to be honest but let's take a crack at it anyway. When it comes to combat, you have three attacks. Square is a sliding punch that can take out most enemies. Circle is a spin kick that can also be used while in the air. The last one is jump and square that makes Jack do a dive into the ground. This attack comes in handy later on when you have to attack enemies from above. Now when it comes to movement options, there's only a few to help you navigate these areas. It all stems from holding down R1. It serves multiple purposes. The first one is crouch, and to be honest, it only comes in handy on ice. When you try to walk on ice, you slide around everywhere, of course. Well, crouching on ice helps you not do that, but the trade-off is that you move extremely slow. The next one is holding R1 and X. This gives you a long jump, essentially, and it works as an attack, too. The last thing is a simple dodge roll when tapping it while moving. To expand upon the basic combat a little bit more, there are different colored eco orbs that you can grab. The first one is green, and once you collect 50 of these, it restores any lost health. There are big green eco orbs you can also find that will fill up lost health instantly. Also, if you have 50 orbs collected with full health, you kind of have armor. The 50 orbs will take that first hit, leaving the rest of your health untouched. Next up are blue eco orbs. These things make you run faster while also turning you into a magnet of sorts. It makes all collectibles in your vicinity fly towards you, making them easier to collect. The second to last one is the red eco orb that gives your attacks a boost in power. It would have been cooler if it gave you some kind of armor as well to take extra hits, but it doesn't. The last one is the yellow eco orb. This gives you the ability to shoot fireballs. They also lock onto enemies as well, even at great distances, which makes it hella clutch at certain points. You'll be using these moves and power-ups to collect precursor orbs. Precursor orbs are the currency of this game. These things are one of the main ways to obtain power cells. Precursor orbs are scattered all throughout the areas you'll be exploring. Most of the time, you'll need 300 plus to get certain power cells, but you get multiple in those instances. Power cells are the objects you need to progress the story, and that's their only purpose. 
they can also be obtained by doing side missions from people scattered throughout the land. The missions can range from catching a bunch of fish for a fisherman to helping an old man herd his cows back into their pen. There's other collectibles you can go after, but honestly, I skipped them because it wasn't necessary to progress. These stupid scout flies that are scattered everywhere because of Kira. When it comes to enemies, they're nothing to write home about, so I'm not. Let's wrap this up. Now that Gaul and Maya are lost. Yes, Gaul and Maya. The Dark Eco probably destroyed them. Yeah, probably. Jack and Daxter is a pleasant platformer that is laid back and easy to play. Unless you suck at platformers like me, which leads into you getting irritated real quick. The characters are super memorable outside the villains, which I personally think could have used some more work. Visually, this game is unique and easy on the eyes, but rewarding if you look for the small details. With this being the first game in the series, it's very bare bones, making it have less replay value for me. So if I was to base everything off this one game, I wouldn't understand why everybody wants a new one. Hopefully the next two games really show me why everyone wants a new one because this one definitely didn't.